So hello everybody, good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending where you're dialing in from. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Responding to COVID-19, How Can Funders Be Most Supportive? Now, among the attendees, I certainly recognize some familiar names, so welcome. But for those that I have not had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Anna-Marie Harling, and I am the Director and Lead for Philanthropic Collaboration at CoImpact, and it's my pleasure to moderate the webinar today. I'm also delighted to introduce our three speakers. So Olivia Leland, who's the founder and CEO of CoImpact, Rakesh Rajani, our Vice President of Programs, and Sylvia Bastante de Ufahal, our Chief Philanthropy Officer. Now, I know we've all been juggling so much these days, and uh, it certainly seems to me that some webinars are proliferating almost as fast as the virus itself. So firstly, I just wanted to thank you all for your engagement and for taking the time to join us today to discuss this important topic. Because we do have so many um, on this webinar, I think we had over 200 people actually sign up. Um, it won't be possible for everybody to introduce themselves, but what we wanted to do for that is actually um, invite you to use the chat function to introduce yourself with your name and organization and potentially a link to, to describe any of the work that you're doing. So at least we, you know, we can create some feeling of, of community on, on this webinar. Now, in this webinar itself, um, what we wanted to do was share our thoughts on, on a few topics. Um, firstly, why we felt it was important to do this webinar in, in the first place. What we are considering in our response to COVID-19, how we're supporting program partners, uh, what discussions we're having with fellow funders, and finally leave plenty of time for discussion with, with all of you to hear what, what, you, what questions you have and, and what you're actually doing. Now before I, I pass over to Olivia and, uh, and Rakesh, just a few housekeeping notes. We do have 75 minutes in total. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and both the slides we use and the recording itself will be shared afterwards. We've purposely slept some time for discussion uh, and when the time comes, I will ask people who have a question to raise their hands so I can unmute you. And given we have so many people on the webinar today and to ensure everyone who wants to speak can speak, I will ask everyone to be very brief and just state their name, organization, and then ideally 30 seconds for, for your question. Now, if you do have a question but prefer not to, um, to raise your hand, we have a Q&A function here and, and we will be monitoring this as well. And, and thanks to those of you who already submitted questions um, before the webinar, we're aiming to address most of them during the course of the webinar, but if we don't get to them, um, please also feel free to raise your hand and use the chat function um, as, as necessary. So now, without further ado, do let me please pass over to Olivia, the founder and, co um, and CEO of CoImpact. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks, Anne-Marie, and hello, everyone. So um, I thought I would start by sharing a bit about why we actually decided to do this webinar. Um, so first, I think on a personal level, um, in some ways, our instinct in times of crisis is actually to reach out, I think, to others and to connect, um, to talk and to try to work out uh, how to respond. And so um, I think as I'm now looking at all the people who are here, I just am so looking forward to getting to exchange uh, with all of you. And so um, that's really a, a key reason for this is the chance to, uh, to exchange and learn from one another. Um, and then in terms of our work at CoImpact, we've been asking ourselves and been having conversations with other funders who are really thinking about how best to respond to the situation. Um, and so wanting to get to have that conversation. Uh, the day we actually decided to do this webinar, I uh, personally had three conversations that I thought I would share here. Um, the first was with a funder who was really grappling with what to do and said um, that he was trying to figure out how he could save money uh, to put more towards COVID-19 um, and feeling the urgent needs. And so as a result of that was actually asking all the organizations that he was funding um, where they could cut costs um, given that some of their work was being paused due to reduced travel, things like that. Um, 
And so was asking each of them to uh, prepare basically a memo as to where uh, they could cut costs during these times. Um, and then um, shortly afterwards, I had two conversations with NGO leaders, um, one in education um, and the other working in job creation, who said that they'd already been hearing from funders who were pulling out of the work. Um, and that they were nervous about figuring out how to keep their work going um, while also setting up for what would inevitably be the clear increase in need for their work once we get to the other side of this crisis. And so um, given those conversations and ones that I've had um, and that our team has had with many of you and with others, we felt like it would be useful to, uh, to really think about this. And of course, also working with the health focus initiatives that we're supporting and who are so swamped uh, with work in responding to the pandemic um, while also trying to make sure that, health, that the health systems can continue to provide um, the essential services that they need to. Um, and so really why we're here today is three things. So the first is to share some of our thoughts while recognizing that of course we don't have all the answers, um, but what we're, um, basically what we're doing. Um, second is to hear from others. Um, as, as I've mentioned, um, and really to start and, and continue this conversation, um, which we hope will be useful um, to all of us as we continue to grapple with what to do. Um, so as we move into um, you, um, our, our key reflection, um, and we'll get into more detail on this, but really the main reflection that we've had as a team and, um, and beyond when working with our program partners is that in many ways, this is a systems crisis. We're seeing the enormous pressure that there is on health systems everywhere. Um, and I know that many of you are working on this and it's countries with weaker systems that are being hit the hardest. Um, and, um, and it will be. Um, and it's not just about health. As we know, there are over a billion children who are out of school, and so the implications for education systems are enormous. And as governments are asking people to stay at home, we're seeing the huge impact that there are on jobs and livelihoods. Um, and again, it's the poorest and the most marginalized, um, and crucially women, who are often most deeply affected. Um, so really, while Absolutely, there, it, this requires a rapid response and humanitarian aid is definitely needed. We also need to be supporting the actors that have the deep knowledge of these systems and help them to strengthen both now and into the future. So what we're hoping is that this really is not a choice, but rather it's about figuring out how we can stay the course, how we could both respond to the urgent, but also crucially be working to support these initiatives that have already been doing this work on systems to be able to respond both to the emergency now and recover from it and then be ready to face the future shocks. So, it's within this broader reflection that we've been thinking at Co-Impact about how we can support our program partners. And again, as I mentioned, we don't have all the answers, but we've really been thinking about this. Um, and I'll spend 10 seconds here just sharing because I realize that some of you don't actually maybe know what, um, is, what it is that we do at Co-Impact. So very briefly, we're a collaborative fund. We focus on providing longer term larger scale support for systems where we support anchor organizations and coalitions that are working in the areas of health, education, and economic opportunity in low and middle income countries in the global south. And we have a group of funders from around the world who fund these efforts with us. So now I'll go into the five principles that guide our response before turning over to Rakesh to share in more detail. Um, so there are five, and I should say that these are the ones that really are guiding us. Of course, there are more, and also we try to live by these both now, but also always. Um, so the first is active listening, to try to really listen more than we talk. And we hope we can show that here as well in our webinar so that we leave really a, a lot of discussion at uh, time and make sure that we really are listening because that's core in everything we do. And then I think especially in terms of how we support our program partners or our grantees. Um, so this is figuring out what the partners would find most helpful rather than what it is that we can do for them. Second is really acknowledging that this time will be difficult um, and being able to show that, it, that we understand and to work together on figuring out how they're doing and then also how we can support them. Um, the third is in um, asking how we can be supportive, making ourselves available, but really not imposing. Um, what we found is that some people want to talk, others don't, um, and it will probably depend on the timing. And so we're trying to figure out when it is that people would rather be left alone and when it is that we can step in and try to be helpful. 
Fourth, we're, we really are trying to be flexible, and a number of you I know have been writing a lot about this topic, which is really being flexible in terms of the plans and the reporting, being open to discussing the needs to pivot, um, recognizing that there will probably be multiple times of pivoting, that it's not about shifting right now and then saying yes, this is the plan for the future, but really recognizing there's so much shifting, uh, being ready to think about what this will mean for the work both now and later as well. And again, assuring that our funding will not be threatened by this. And then finally, on the topic of funding, we, we, and I know many of you were doing this as well, are really trying to figure out how to connect partners to potential additional funding, recognizing that the needs really are increasing across the board and figuring out how we can do that in a way that is simple and not burdensome, especially now given the urgent needs. Um, so how it is that we can then uh, really support this work. So really what we see is our job as funders is um, in working with our partners to say, what do you need now? What will you need on the other side of this and how can we best support you to get there? Um, so I'll turn over to Rakesh, but before doing that, I just wanted to also note that um, we know that we're very much not alone in, in, in this. And so I think even as we are having this conversation, we'll be very keen to hear what do you think we're missing here? Um, what other things are you doing? Um, and as we continue to learn about how best to respond, and you'll see at the end of the presentation, we've put some of the resources we found most helpful, um, two of the pledges that we've signed on to um, that some of you initiated, um, and we'll be keen uh, to hear about more uh, as we go. So uh, with that, I'll turn over to Rakesh. Thank you so much, Olivia. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. What you see on your screen now is a, is a simple and I think a really powerful quote that the Community Health Impact Coalition, of which our program partner, Last Mile Health, is a leading member, put together, which very much underlines, I think, the point uh, Olivia was making around why we need to support systems and as particularly at this time of crisis. It's so tempting to think perhaps the right thing to do is to set up a quick separate standalone rapid response fund or to be able to send in a SWAT team, but really the most helpful thing is to support underlying systems. So this quote here, and I'm just gonna read it because I think it captures so much of the key points that all efforts must build on existing platforms rather than set up new ones, existing infrastructure and relationships, and support ministries of health and regional authorities as they lead science-based coordinated responses. That's, a, that's very much the view that is kind of guiding all our work in health as well as outside health. So I'm going to share now the specifics of, our, of what our uh, program partners are doing. We work in rounds uh, and uh, annual rounds of funds and our first round of partners are four major initiatives of this, uh, the ones that you see on your screen. In total, they constitute about 20 different organizations, and all of them are deeply affected by COVID-19. Um, for example, our program partner, Teaching at the Right Level, uh, in, that works across six African countries in education to help children learn, you know, all the school systems in all the countries that they work are closed. Uh, teachers are not able to travel. The training and the support and the mentoring they do that used to happen in person can't happen. The trainers that exchange lessons across countries are not also able to do that. Or to take our program partner, uh, the graduation program that works in, uh, in Bihar in India, that works in Paraguay and Colombia, as well as through the World Bank in 10 other countries of the world. Um, they reach the poorest households in providing them kind of core supports. Uh, these are often uh, really marginalized, uh, low-income households, often headed by women, that get their sense of support from people visiting them and them coming together in weekly meetings. A lot of those are now not happening in most of those countries. So the in entire infrastructure has ground, ground to a halt. And that's the bad news. Uh, at the same time though, what people are doing is not, uh, you know, people are responding as best they, they can. The teachers, for example, are not only teachers of, you know, in the classroom for the kids, they are often the go-to people in communities as to what to do. As people struggle, for example, with information, there's lots of good information, but there's even more misinformation. It's often the teacher who helps clarify that. Thanks to apps such as WhatsApp, you find teachers playing this role, very much kicking into that role. Others are selling, is sharing less you know, ideas of what can you do with children? How can you take care of your children and protect them and protect yourself at the same time? And the same sets of things are happening with our graduation program. 
In fact, many countries are finding, uh, like Olivia was saying, that in a crisis like this, because it is the poorest that get hit the hardest, many countries are finding that it's often the infrastructure for the social protection programs that are part of our graduation program that are, that are the only, uh, that is the only network, that's the only infrastructure that can be used to help people. And so they are leveraging those systems to reach people with information, with support, with advice, with advocacy, so they can access the care that they need. Uh, we have two health partners, uh, just to go back to round one, we have two health partners, uh, Project ECHO and Last Mile Health that I mentioned earlier. They are kicking in a lot, uh, very briefly with Project ECHO. They have a system uh, uh, using video technology, Zoom, which is what we're using now, to reach people with information that is being used in the US, that is being used in India, that is being used in 14 countries across Africa and a number of other Asian countries to quickly scale up the training for people, for health workers in the most remote places, so they know what to do to update protocols so they can take care of themselves and help people learn. Similarly with Last Mile Health, Last Mile Health is working in Liberia, Malawi, um, and Ethiopia to support the health systems of those countries to scale up and particularly focusing on community health workers who are often the only people who are able, you know, that will, that will be able to reach people. Most of those countries don't have a doctor they can access, so those community health workers become the vital supports. And, and they are also supporting the WHO in terms of the global response. So that's our round one partners. Let me move to round two. Um, round two are, are in a design phase. These partners are at the moment right now working out their large systems change uh, plans and how they can prepare for them. They are all affected because in, you know, schools are closed down, health systems are all you know, locked up, uh, travel cannot happen. So with all of them, what we're doing is, uh, is being flexible, as Olivia uh, emphasized, to be able to, we are considering elongating the time frame, but deciding that based on listening to them. We don't know whether they need one extra month or four extra months. We are, we are very much listening to them right now and trying to tailor our response based on what their needs are, being flexible with the ways in which we support them. They are also very much learning quickly. So many of the answers uh, have not yet been developed and we're trying to support them often by connecting them with other people who can give them the help that they need. And then finally, if I move to round three, which is our open call right now, uh, this is for grants that are focusing on gender and in Global South rootedness in the areas of health, education, and economic opportunity. Uh, we had the deadline for submitting concept notes was March 31st. We extended that to April 30th to give people an additional month uh, given this crisis. And right now we are considering the entire timeline and see how we can uh, change that in ways that will be fit for this particular moment. Um, let me close with, with just a, a set of reflections of what does this mean for the global south? All of us who live in, in Europe and in the US and places like that, uh, in some ways we know what it is that we need to do and there are very serious needs that we have. I live in New York, which is you know, soon going to, is really struggling right now. But that said, as you can imagine, these problems are hugely, hugely, hugely compounded for countries like India where we work and many other countries around the world. And there are immediate humanitarian needs there as well. People don't have enough to eat, people don't have access to clean water and emergency needs. And we think those are absolutely legitimate needs. In our view, groups like us as Coimpact and many others in the global north, I think are not the best place to respond quickly to those humanitarian crises. We think it's local groups that are often best in place. Sometimes they will need additional support from outside, but the key is that the driver of the humanitarian response needs to be organizations on the ground. Second, I think you may also have seen in social media and elsewhere, really horrific scenes of, for example, policemen in Kenya and India beating up on people as they try to enforce kind of lockdown. There's a, and, and the people who get hurt the most, are, again, the people who are the most vulnerable, the people who are the poorest, the people who are not able to defend their rights. So there's really important work that we should not forget in terms of shoring up basic human rights and civic liberties. And there are human rights organizations and community organizations and women's groups that are speaking out on those things that are trying to advocate 
for the protection of people and for making sure the state does not abuse their powers during this emergency time to undermine people's health and well-being. And I think those groups are also very important to support. They are not our core partners for co-impact, but we are very grateful for many funders who support that sort of work. Another big issue here is the whole issue of surveillance. If you look at countries like China, as we know, Israel, they, is, they are in, in the name of being able to track people. There's all kinds of surveillance going on, which may be helpful at this time, but what are the regulations and safeguards in place to make sure that this doesn't become the new norm and undermines privacy and human rights? And the groups fighting that, I think, are really important as well. Where we focus in uh, is on the strengthening and deepening the long-term work of systems uh, and policy. This work is long-term, but it is absolutely what is needed now. Why? Because if you ask the question, who or what infrastructure can reach most people, the vast majority of people, quickly in ways that are meaningful, in ways that are present in the communities, where there are relationships that are trusted, where people know the context, where people understand what's going on. It's really those, that, those systems and that infrastructure that is needed the most. I'll give you just some numbers. Right now, every day, 4,000 people die from tuberculosis. 1,500 people die every day from malaria. Those people and the system supporting them are going to be deeply affected by COVID. So in order to mount a response, you, you can't kind of isolate COVID-19 from everything else. They need to be integrated. And the people who are probably most vulnerable to die from COVID are the people who have TB. And the best way to support them again is to support the actors on the ground who are working closely with governments and public systems to be able to mount an integrated response that again will reach the most people quickly and that are likely to last, like Olivia was saying, not only today, but also tomorrow and what is needed going into the future. So let me stop here and I'd, uh, I have, a, I'm, Anna Marie, should I answer some of those questions asked or should we come to those later? I think perhaps we, we, we have quite a lot of time for discussion at the end, so we can go back and um, once we get there, I think it's probably best. Okay. Perfect. Now over so, to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Anori. Um, so we also wanted to, to have a, a brief discussion about what have we been hearing uh, from fellow founders. The first question is, are we seeing a shift away from systems funding or um, are we seeing additional uh, systems funding? And as you know, going back, we focus on, on systems change. And in January of this year, we published a, a joint report titled Embracing Complexity Towards a Shared Understanding of Funding Systems Change, developed jointly with Ashoka, Catalyst 2030, Echo and Green, Shrub Foundation, and Skull Foundation. Um, and our take is that funding for systems change is a nascent but still growing movement. So we were seeing quite a bit of momentum moving in this direction before COVID-19. After COVID-19, um, we believe that the consequences of lack of investment in systems are, are very clear for many to see. Uh, however, not, not many funders are yet framing this as a systems issue. Um, and that is obviously quite important to us. I think in terms of the levels of philanthropic response, um, we look at, at three, three things. And here I may echo some of the points that have already been made by my colleagues. Um, the first one is the, the, the crisis response. Um, obviously, as Rakesh was mentioning, there's a humanitarian crisis, especially in low and middle income countries, which requires an urgent response. And here we see that uh, local philanthropy is, is usually best placed uh, to respond to this. At a, at a global level, um, there has obviously been a, an outpouring of, of resources, especially towards public health responses for more research and development and training for healthcare workers. And, and many large international uh, funders are, are coming to this. The second level um, that we consider is the existing philanthropy response. Um, and here, what we're seeing is this need for additional flexibility, um, as was mentioned by my colleagues, um, not only for those working on health systems, but, but for nonprofits that are working across a range of topics, including education, including human rights, and many others, 
many of, of our partners have, um, have uh, offered new facilities ranging from stipends to different forms of rapid response funds um, to even no interest loans. Uh, in effect, if you've been looking at the chat that we've been having here, uh, a number of you have, have put forward that your, your foundations have created this type of rapid response to, to, to deal with the crisis. Um, last Thursday, we had a webinar with over 35 of members of our funding community, and uh, pretty much everything that we've said so far in terms of the need for flexibility um, and the need for being supportive of existing grantees uh, was echoed there. And as Co-Impact, we have also signed both the London Funders Pledge and the Council of Foundations Pledge um, commitment to, to flexibility. On the other hand, what we're hearing from nonprofits um, is that many funders are choosing to delay or pull out of existing commitments, um, as Olivia mentioned as well in her, in her introduction, and so that some of them are almost using the excuse of COVID-19 to change course in ways that they wanted to uh, in any case. And, and we're hearing from many nonprofits that are doing excellent work in many different parts of the world that they're really finding a, a hard time with, with funders uh, pulling out of existing programs. Um, and finally, there is the longer term response. And I guess here um, the, key, the key word is uncertainty. Um, I, I don't think any of us truly understand how, how this crisis will fundamentally affect the work that our partners are doing, especially in low and middle income countries. And, and we still believe that a focus on, on strengthening systems is important, uh, but also acknowledge that there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, and we also believe that this crisis in some ways is, is going to question a little bit the role of philanthropy. Are we going to shift the power dynamics with the relationships between the, the funders and the nonprofits change? Will we see greater focus on social justice, for example, equity and fairness um, as part of, of this new uh, relationship? So, so the point here is just to remain flexible and open-minded, uh, given it's, it's all we can do in the, in the current situation. Um, finally, I, I want to touch briefly on a different point, which is uh, related to the economic impacts of COVID-19 um, uh, versus the willingness to give. So, so there's no doubt that COVID-19 is having huge economic impacts around the world. Um, here, there, there is still a distinction between those funders that have committed finder funding, uh, for example, privately endowed foundations versus other funders that have to raise or, or produce their funding every year. So for example, fundraise, fundraising foundations, in some cases, corporate foundations and even governmental or, or multilaterals. Many funders do commit their, their funding one year in advance. Um, so depending on the timing of when that funding is committed, it may be difficult to shift. But the bigger issue is what happens in 2021 when fundamentally returns of invest on investments are doing poorly, even for endowed foundations where businesses are not thriving and when governments maybe have other priorities. And we know from, from the previous uh, the 2008 financial crash that giving in the UK, for example, individual giving fell by 11% and total giving in the US fell by 7%. Um, so, so clearly, you know, COVID-19 will potentially have an impact in terms of, of the, the, the giving that is done. At the same time, we also pointed to, wanted to point out that there's a difference between the very real economic impact uh, that we will affect some funders more than others, but also the less tangible willingness to give in the moment. Um, and, and many funders uh, simply do not feel that now is the time to make new commitments, or they feel that they want to fund something that is uh, purely related to addressing the pandemic, the pandemic in, the, in the present moment. Um, in, in closing, I just wanted to share that I was rereading a line from the, the document that I mentioned, the Embracing Complexity Report. And in January of this year, in the preface, we had, writ we had written, together we can change the system of funding, transformative change, so that humanity is better equipped to address the urgent challenges we face. Um, obviously, when, when we wrote this in January, we had no idea how urgent this new challenge of COVID-19 would be. Um, or that we would all need to come together to, to help strengthen and transform uh, systems and, and how important this work would be. Uh, but to end on a personal note, I, I have the pleasure of knowing many of you on this call 
and it gives me great pleasure and great hope um, to believe that by coming together, we could actually uh, address these challenges. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sylvia. And thank you, Olivia and Rakesh. Um, in you know the spirit of of listening and and um, being open, we really wanted to kind of dedicate the the rest of this webinar to to really a discussion to to a question um, kind of session. What we have received is there were three ways really that people have asked us questions. One is um, beforehand, people submitted um, questions. Um, so I think we will take those first. Then while we're doing that, there is the raise the hand uh, functionality here. So I see one hand raised at the moment, but please do think about your question and raise your, your hands if you would like to, like to speak. We will then go and take some of those questions. And then um, finally, there's also the Q&A, and I see there's a couple of questions potentially coming through on there on the Q&A function. So there's many ways in which we can engage with all of you, uh, and that's what we'd really like, we'd like to be able to do. So to start off, um, I think we, we wanted to respond to some of the questions we received beforehand. Um, Rakesh briefly mentioned that in his speech, so I will just um, open up to Rakesh to address some of the questions that, that we received beforehand. Thank you, Anna-Marie. So one of the questions was if delivery of grantee operations have been temporarily suspended, for example, construction or in-person training, what does that mean for our grants? For example, will the grantee still receive the full committed grant to cover fixed operating costs, etc.? So the, the short answer, let me also just maybe ask, say the second question, because I think they have similar answers, is that can the 2020 committed funds be applied to emergency measures, for example, investments in transitioning to online platforms, right? That people may need to need to invest in. And can they use the resources that we've already given them for that purpose? So I think the answer to both of those is yes. And the reason is because we want to equip our partners to be able to function, to be able to take care of themselves and their families, and then to be able to do the work that they that they do. So even right now, even though they may not be able to do the kind of normal work, uh, the fact is that those people who work in those organizations, they have responsibilities for themselves and their families, and we need to take care of them. That's just basic human decency, and we need that. We need to do that because it's the right thing to do, but also because these very people are the ones that we, will, we need today and we need in the future to be able to mount the response. Even though the teachers, for example, are not in the classrooms, like I said earlier, they are in fact doing the work. They are the go-to people and reference people, uh, and the same for health workers and same for men. And you don't want to lose people, right? It takes many years to train people and prepare people. And if a system just or a funder just pulls out the money at this time because they are not doing the normal work, you lose incredible infrastructure when at the very moment in which, which you need that. Um, is, you know, in the similarly for when we do we fund the kind of, uh, say, transition to online, absolutely, because that's how we function. Look, look at us now. We are having this webinar. Uh, all of us at CoImpact are continuing to work every day normally in many ways because through, through the technology. And similarly, we want to support our partners to do that as well. Um, so our message is at this time, um, all the time, but particularly at this time, even more so, we need to support our partners to be able to have what they need to take care of themselves and to continue doing the work, to be flexible, to be understanding. And, and that's how systems get shored up and that's how we make sure that people get the support they need. Right. Thank you, Rakesh. Um, I think the other questions we had, we, we kind of covered in the, in the presentation. So um, thank you to, to both of you. Now I wanted to go to, to the live questions, people who are willing to, to, speak, to speak aloud. Um, I see one hand raised right now, um, and we'll also then come to the Q&A. As I said, if um, I will unmute you, and then please state your name and organization, and please try to keep your question short. Thank you. Please go ahead, Mara. I don't seem to be able to unmute you. Um, is there somebody else you can help with unmuting? Yeah, this is difficult. Perhaps 
perhaps it's easier if um, you, you type your question into the chat, then we can actually uh, refer to it there. I'm trying to find a... Is everybody able to? Yeah, my sense is we just asked Mara to submit it in Q&A. Yeah, yeah, I think Perhaps we so. take the others on Q&A first and then we can... Absolutely, ask. let's do that. Thank you, Akesh. Silva, you can see the Q&A, right? I pass over to you to ask the questions. Yeah, so I'm, I'm referring a question from, from Anja Connie from EVPA. Um, she's asking two questions, I'll combine them in one. So essentially, what is our approach to working with the development financing agencies like BFID, USAID, SEC, CEDA, and others? Um, and how to engage them on, on COVID-19? And, and also, if we have seen any other interesting finance mechanisms to respond um, to, the, to the COVID crisis. Rakesh, do you want to? Sure, I can start off in particular on the second one. Maybe Sylvia, you may want to respond. So, you know, our, partner, our current partnerships already engage with many of the funders like DFID and USAID and CEDA that you mentioned. Um, so we continue that partnership. We, some, we get on calls together to see how we can support best, what sorts of pivots we need to make. So it's something we used to do in the past and we continue to do so now. Very importantly, the way we do so and what we try to advocate for is listening to our program partners. Like what is the change that's needed? And in many ways, in, in, as we try to figure this out, meaning us, the other funders and the program partner, which is what we call our grantees, um, we really try to put the program partner in the driver's seat. What is needed? Why? Because they are closest to the ground. They have the relationships. They have a deeper understanding of what's going on. And so those relationships are very much continuing. And as far as the, the kind of funding responses, I'll, I'll start it off. And I think Sylvia and others may want to add is, you know, we are staying the course with our funding. We have reassured people that, you know, don't worry, that support is there. Uh, for, for partners like Project ECHO and Last Mile Health who are gearing up deeper and bigger responses as a result of the crisis. We are connecting them with other funders who can provide flexible and quick support. Remember, at this time, it's all hands on deck. They're working hard to respond to the crisis. They don't have the time to write all these proposals and so forth. And so these are groups, because we've already vetted them, uh, it means that the due diligence has already been done and kind of money can be quickly gotten to them. But I know that there are a number of other funds that are being set up and perhaps Sylvia, Olivia, are better place to respond to that. Um, I'll, I'll take the answer to that question and then uh, we, did, we do have that now the question from Mara um, Rakesh. So in terms of other funders, there's, there's a variety of, of uh, models, including the rapid response funds that we already mentioned. We know there's other funders who are focused more on supporting local businesses. Um, there's funders that are supporting uh, economic livelihoods, in, in, especially in low and middle income countries. So there's quite a variety of responses um, and we're very, very encouraged by that. And at the same time, we know that a lot more will be required. Um, and just to echo what Rakesh said, ASCO Impact, we have made a facility available for any funder that would like to support the efforts of, of Last Mile Health and of Project ECHO. Um, to work on health system strengthening and especially responding to the COVID crisis. Uh, so we're, we're happy to facilitate donations uh, towards them and we can send more information for anybody who's interested afterwards. So I wanted to come back to the question from Mara that we uh, were not able to, to hear directly. Um, she said, I'm curious to know if you allow organizations to use funds in a different way, e.g. towards COVID response, The short answer is yes. I mean, we, we are collectively focused on the long-term goal and we continue to be focused on that goal, but you can't achieve that goal if there's a crisis today, right? So you might, you might say your goal is to build a bridge, but if your house is on fire, you need to address to that. So to us, we don't see a contradiction between being able to address the immediate challenge you have uh, and the fact that we have long-term goals. And, you know, our partners, they, even they more than anybody else, care about achieving those long-term goals. They are their goals. They are dedicated and committed to, to them. So we are not worried that by allowing them to flexibly perhaps divert some funds to address immediate needs or to be able to, to build up their capacity in ways, to, for example, to be able to communicate online, 
that that detracts. If anything, we think taking care of that allows them to more effectively then get back on track on focusing on the large term goals as they are. So we, it's not a, in our case, it's not a, a blanket uh, uh, approval. If they do want to make those changes, we say, please get on the phone or get in contact with the account lead who works with them. They have a discussion and they come mutually to an agreement as to how the adjustments can be made. Thanks, Rakesh. Um, we have another very interesting question from Carolyn Fiennes. Uh, and this one, I think maybe Olivia could, could uh, give an answer to. Do you think that funders should swap priorities, e.g. to work from, move away from work that's not massively urgent and towards work that is very urgent, for example, domestic violence or child abuse um, and frontline health working? In this time, uh, is this the time to not fund a blue sky research project and fund domestic violence instead? So I guess my answer to this would be a bit of what we've been um, talking about and what I know a number of you have been focused on, which is, is the short answer is I think, yes, now is the moment to think about the urgent, but with the major caveat to think about the urgent, but for the long term, right? So it's both what is needed now and how do we think about that? And then also set up, because if you take the domestic violence example, of course, this has been an urgent need. It is all the more urgent now. And as we think about what as funders we can do to respond, what's actually needed both now, but then also that you could be building that could then also be useful after the, the crisis in terms of what the funders could be doing. Uh, so I think it's, it, it's a bit of, of, of both, but definitely a, um, both the urgent and the long term. Others have anything to add on that? Great stuff, thank you. Um, now I think let's try the um, the people who are you who had raised their hands. So so Beth Foster, I've allowed you to speak. Now if you unmute yourself, we should be able to hear you. So so let's try. Beth, can you unmute yourself? I'm hoping this will work. I can actually. Woohoo! <laughs> so the, the funny thing is, I didn't purposefully raise my hand, so we tested the technology. Okay. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't, in fact, have a question. <laughs> okay, oh well. Okay, so then I will put your hand down, but at least this means that we can, we can work. And if anybody else has a question, please do raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, I do see there are other questions on Q&A. And so uh, Sylvia to, to ask them to Olivia and Rakesh. And, and just, just for people to be thinking, I just wanted to add a bit, which is do, don't only keep yourselves to questions. We definitely want to make sure that people also, as you have reflections, comments, um, I know the chat function has been great for sharing things too, but do share out here too if there are things you want to make sure um, that we're all thinking about. So there's a, a couple of questions which relate to funding, one from Chad Bolick asking where we have seen fund our founders um, step up and accelerate the, their funding and, and have we encouraged to do this um, and is this best practice? And related to that, uh, there's a question from, from Stephanie Heckman about um, that philanthropy has a critical role to play in acting quickly on flexibility because obviously public funding sometimes takes a little bit longer. Um, so are there any best practices that we have seen um, when funders reach out to their, to their partners? Um, so for example, sending additional funds, clarifying that funds can be used for, for different purposes. Um, I'll take a, a quick answer to, those, to both of those and then I'll let my colleagues come in. And, and then I think we're getting a number of other questions as well. Um, so in terms of have we asked our funders to step up and accelerate their funding? Certainly, as I mentioned, we had a conversation with 35 uh, of our closest funders uh, last week and many of them are doing more um, and more quickly uh, to support some of the the efforts on COVID-19, both the emergency response, but very importantly, uh, also keeping their eye on the longer term systems change, which is the work that we are supporting. Um, and to Stephanie's que question, yeah, I mean, that's exactly the role of private philanthropy, that it can actually act quickly and with flexibility in times of, of crisis. Um, so I think all the, all the points that you mentioned in your question is exactly what we've been saying that funders should do that they should give flexibility to the, to the grantees, um, that they should connect them to other opportunities for funding if, 
if that's possible. Um, and, and really, most importantly, listening to them and not imposing our solutions, but, but really taking it from where they're at and what are their needs and, and how would they like to be supported in times like this. Um, we had a, um, a comment from um, Funda. Exactly. So Funda now is able to speak if she um, unmutes herself. Yes, absolutely. Hi, this is Funda Sesge uh, from Norfam Foundation. We're based in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, under normal circumstances, we work with uh, impact tech entrepreneurs and we support them through an in-house VC fund, impact investing fund, and then a, a hub where the entrepreneurs sit together. And uh, given the, the crisis, we decided to, to shift our focus. Um, at least 80% of our team is now working on a platform we put together called Action Against Corona. And the idea is to, to gather uh, different uh, actors in the space. Um, so we're basically offering uh, capital support as well as like uh, volunteer talent uh, exposure to, to the good initiatives and then also uh, other resources that our partner organizations or not our partner but any partner organization is basically extending so we've reached out to our entire network and gathering a lot of stakeholders in the, the platform and on the funding side uh, what we decided to do since this is put together like in really 48 hours pretty much this whole platform uh, we decided that uh, we can basically open up a, a donation channel uh, for those uh, that are uh, like that need speedy uh, funding and then uh, our VC fund also created a fast track channel uh, for those that are then looking into the, the at the more medium term uh, solutions so we're trying to, to capture both uh, ends and the, the, the donation side is, is really very quick. We have one uh, filtering mechanism and then next is a decision to, to fund. Uh, we've received over 600 applications so far, not just from Sweden, um, wherever we could reach. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, donated uh, to, to four initiatives already. And uh, yeah, it's, it keeps coming. So my numbers might be outdated by the time uh, I entered this call. Great. Thank you, thank you, Fonda. Um, and I see uh, Nagma also has a um, has a hand raised. Now you should also be able to talk, Nagma, if you unmute yourself. Yes, I think I have unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, join this call, and a lot of what uh, has been said over the last uh, forty-five minutes uh, resonated very well. I thought that from our experience back uh, in uh, India, I could, uh, you know, just add uh, and, and just reiterate some of the things that were said. Um, in our usual course of work, uh, we are a grant maker, but we also very actively connect other funders and, and share our information with other funders so they can, they can identify their grantees as well. And our focus is on grantees uh, who haven't scaled so far, but have the potential. So a lot of our support goes to local organizations. So I really appreciate the point that was made that local organizations are best placed to uh, be, you know, the, at the front line of a lot of the work that is happening. And we found uh, that in practice as well. Uh, what we also found is once we decided that our, our funding will be flexible, when we communicated it to them, when we communicated that uh, salaries must be paid in time, the workforce within the NGOs must be supported, uh, we also had to spread the message to our peers and other funders who had been, uh, you know, either funding the same organizations or funding others. But uh, I think a little bit of responsibility also is in spreading the message to our peers so that uh, because all of us are uh, are in a in a situation where there is no precedence, so we're doing the best we can. But uh, but but uh, sharing our practices really encourages others to follow suit, and then the joint force is quite strong. So I think I would I like to add the point that along with uh, ourselves following some good practices, we need to get a herd alongside with us. Um, for Ilgiv, what worked is uh, that we. Uh, because of the many hours that came, we actually mapped the initiatives across different geographies in India. We currently have at least 70 initiatives that are working on relief to migrant populations that have been displaced because of COVID-19. 
And what we did in turn is uh, whatever we could not support, we just started sharing it very liberally. And that led to a lot of good funding reaching causes uh, that were needed to be funded. Uh, before I close, one last point is uh, just like good local organizations uh, need good uh, funding support, even within funders, local funders uh, connected to international funders, small funders connected to large funders uh, makes a lot of sense because our decision making also uh, be focused in one direction. Um, just wanted to say this much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nagma. No, that was that was great. Um, and I think I, I see Fran that you have um, your hand raised. Now I've enabled you to be able to speak. So if you unmute yourself, please do share your question or reflections on what we've been been discussing so far. Thanks, Anna Marie. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share briefly what I've been doing with our foundation, the Indigo Trust, which is a UK trust, but uh, primarily supporting sub-Saharan African. Uh, organizations. Apologies if you can hear my kids yelling in the background. Um, we have immediately taken action to change our operating procedures. So we contacted all grantees to tell them that we were switching their grants to unrestricted core operating costs, um, unrestricted funds, although most of our grantees were already working under that basis. And where relevant to drop uh, timelines for reporting and m and &E, understanding that this should not be their priority at the moment. Um, separately, we've been trying to work on our overall approach to funding around um, COVID-19. So we split this into three stages, crisis response, second stage, and a third stage of recovery and rebuilding. The crisis response was very much about getting money out of the door quickly but strategically so in the uk that's meant a major donation to the trussell trust which is a food bank network here and a major donation to the national emergency fund which while it's a relatively new initiative will be distributing funds through a national network of community foundations so going ahead with your principle about supporting organizations already operating on the ground with the best knowledge of need in their local communities. Um, we're planning a second stage in a month or so when we'll have a much clearer picture of the scale of the disaster and the different kinds of impact. Um, and also where we'll be looking at helping key organizations survive whose um, income's been severely restricted. The third stage will be as we come out of the other side, which will be about recovery and rebuilding. Um, the charity sector in the UK alone expects to lose 4 billion within the next couple of months as donations drop and fundraising events are cancelled. Um, so we need to help organisations get through that. Um, I think it's also a time for donor advocacy, um, leading uh, peer initiatives, not to start up new things, but I think everyone on this call is already pretty motivated um, to do this well. We need to reach out to other people with the potential to give and underline the urgency of it. Um, also, to, to make sure that good donor advice services don't go under. We've never needed good advice more. Um, so happy to talk further to any of that, but that's how we're trying to think about it. Great. Thank you, Fran. No, that's, it's always super helpful to hear from others how, how you are approaching it. And it's certainly, um, I think these discussions certainly inform it with Olivia Raquel, Sylvia, and myself in our approach and how we do things. Um, I see that a lot um, of questions coming through on the Q&A. So maybe I turn now to Sylvia um, to, to go through those questions and then perhaps Olivia Rakesh, Sylvia, we can have a, a discussion ar around them. Uh, yes, so I will, I will mention three questions on the Q&A and, and another one that we've received via WhatsApp. Um, so Flora Keller was asking whether we have any feedbacks from the communities and projects as to the actual situation within their own circles, how are they affected at this point and how do they see the, the situation evolving. Um, maybe that would be something for Rakesh uh, to address. Another question for Rakesh 
is the one posted by Julie Ramos on the Q and A. Um, he mentioned that the best uh, that that the local groups and communities are best equipped to respond to the health crisis. And, and will be best equipped to respond as, as both the health and economic crisis continues to unfold. The question is, how do we as funders, who typically fund global large organizations that often, often pass through their funding to local organizations, how do we fund and promote mutual aid with the, with the local or grassroots um, responses or the local communities? Um, and then we have two other questions, which I mentioned now, and then we can see who, who takes them. Um, the, there's one about funding, international funding versus local funding. So given that this pandemic is affecting every country across the globe, um, the, the person, is Christopher Korth, is interested in knowing um, whether we foresee a decline in the flow of philanthropic capital from, from wealthier nations to, to low and middle income countries, uh, because most is being shifted to their own communities. Um, and the last question I would uh, mention is the one from Anna Kuntz with respect to the what are some of the best practices about cash on hands to, to use during a crisis. Um, she's assuming there are no single right answers, but should organizations have maybe over six months of available cash? Um, and, and how are funders being partners to these organizations and thinking strategically? about how this crisis may affect them in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Great, so Olivia, Rakesh, um, who, who would like to jump in and take the first question? Olivia, do you want to start? Do you want me to go? Sure, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go with, I'll, I'll, I'll take the one that's actually on um, finding of local organizations, which I think is is a bit um, connected to what we were both talking about. Um, I guess this goes back a little bit. I think the key here, and this is behind some of the philosophy behind Co-Impact, which is to try to find those um, also not just now, but whenever we're really trying to figure out working on systems. So it doesn't necessarily mean only the smaller organizations, but actually organizations that have a deep knowledge um, of the um, the current environment and so thinking about how to do that is actually working in many ways it actually involves going and finding others that might be if we can think about obviously you know we as co-impact do that a number of others along the chat are also doing that and so trying to think about how to find other funders who might um, be able to help but then also crucially um, using open call mechanisms to try to ensure that in a relatively fast order, one can actually uncover some more of the local organizations that really have the deep knowledge um, of the systems to be able to provide um, both the, um, the kind of trusted partner to um, often to government when we're really talking about the systems work. Um, so that's, I think, one of the, um, the key pieces. So it's, 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 it's basically using existing um, networks and then also trying to uncover some that you might not otherwise through the um, through the use of these open calls. Um, so that's that's one. I was tracking some of the others, but maybe I'll turn back to you, Rakesh, for a second while I look at my notes. Great. Thanks, Olivia. So um, the first question was, you know, are we are we listening to community groups? Are we listening to our partners? The, the short answer is very much so. We uh, a couple of weeks ago we we reached out to all our partners and said, look, we know this is going on, it's affecting us, it must be affecting you. We want you to know that we understand that you know this is this is there. So if you want to talk about it, please do. You know, reach out. And how can we be of help? And what's happened is we've had conversations with all of our partners. With some, there have been multiple conversations because that's what they've needed. They've wanted to talk um, and they've wanted uh, guidance in terms of the terms of the of our contract. Others have wanted specific types of help. Others have asked us if we can connect them. Uh, if we have ideas about a problem they are dealing with. So we've had those sorts of conversations. Um, some of the groups are so all hands on deck. They have sent us literally a one sentence communication and said, look, we, we handling all this stuff. Can you in effect leave us alone? And we've also wanted to respect that as well, fully understanding that they have, you know, they are busy doing things. What we found is that with some of our partners, um, they have had to step back a little bit and plan. So for example, our teaching at the right level is 
informally, um, their, their infrastructure is doing lots of work, but formally they're stepping back and evaluating the situation. They are very much, you know, the program teaching at the right level was designed to focus on children who, who need to catch up, children who have fallen behind in terms of their learning needs. Now, as Olivia was saying, with close to one and a half billion children all over the world, in almost every country in the world, out of school, one and a half billion children will need to catch up sometime. So they are beginning to think with their government partners, with their technology partners, is there anything we can do to respond to that situation when these children are, are finally able to go back to school or even if they are not, while they are not able to go to school, is there, are there measures that we can do? So they are very much in that mode. Whereas other partners like uh, our partner Harambe, for example, or our round two partner, are finding they have to ramp up suddenly as the government of South Africa tries to figure out what to do and they are one of the most affected countries in, on the continent of Africa, they are very much finding that the infrastructure of Harambe is needed. So in their case, they are ramping up their work. Uh, similarly with our partner Jivika, uh, Jivika Bandhan and Jaipal South Asia in Bihar, they are finding that um, across the most impoverished parts of uh, Bihar, uh, it is really the women's groups that are part of the Jivika system that are the backbone of the response. They are using that for education. They are using that for organizing responses. They are using that to identify and reach out to the most vulnerable people. They are reaching out to do advocacy. Uh, as, as you may have seen, there's all kinds of uh, terrible forced migration happening in India right now. And it's really the Jivika system that's also able to respond to influxes. They are expecting uh, today, for example, 150,000 people uh, to come into Bihar, who many of them who don't have places to stay. And it's this very, very system that is responding. So as we have these conversations and we hear these things, we are trying to be as supportive as we can and connect them with resources. In, in this case, for example, there was a legal resource we knew about in Delhi that was helpful. And we made an informal connection between the Bihar and Delhi uh, on, on that legal help. So that's very much uh, what's going on. We don't try to listen directly to communities ourselves. We rely on our partners who have the trusted relationships to be listening to the community and making the best decisions that they need to make. Um, maybe very briefly, the question of uh, Julie uh, Ramos's question on local groups. I think it's a great question. Uh, in the US context, I think if you, there is a resource uh, I, and one of the philanthropy journals on all the community foundations that are responding, they are a great place to go. Sometimes, however, the community foundations tend to be not so diverse. So they, uh, they are all kinds of groups, particularly women's groups and people of color organizations who are part of national affiliations, such as national, you know, such as People's Actions, such as the Center for Community Change. Um, um, alliances such as those are often able to channel resources very quickly in the U.S. context and you have similar networks. As Olivia was emphasizing, in order to reach scale, we often work with larger networks who are connected with and have as members or as affiliates lots of the community groups and that's how we find one of the more effective ways of reaching, reaching people. Let me stop now and turn it back. I might just, because there were a few questions on what's going to happen with funding. I think the, the answer that I would give to this, Sylvia, you should jump in, or Anna-Marie, if you have additional thoughts. I think we don't know yet. So I think the thing that we, and going back to what Fran was saying, I think this is the moment for, you know, those, for, for all of us, basically, to try to do what we can to make the point that now is the time to step up. It's not about making shifts between things, but it actually will require really stepping up and saying, yes, we need to do the urgent, yes, we need to do the long term, and actually let's think about how we do these different things and that it's not about shifting. Um, so one of the questions was, will, will when, as people are really looking towards um, uh, whether you foresee a decline in the flow of philanthropic capital from wealthier nations to the less wealthy um, as they shift their focus to their own communities, as we know that this anyway is, is such a small portion of overall funding generally, as so much as actually tends to be within its own country. Um, so really, um, you know, making the point as we look back to what Rakesh was saying of the tremendous need um, that there is 
um, you know, to, to, to keep, keep one's eye on what, um, what this means, of course, in one's own country and specifically around vulnerable communities. Um, and then also, um, as we, as, as, as the crisis continues and as we see the impact um, in countries in the global south. So I think um, we, we don't know, but we need to be keeping an eye on it and um, really looking to think about how there can be advocacy by donors who are saying, look, now is the moment to really double down on what it is that we're doing. Um, and here's how we could do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was just one question that was not answered. Uh, maybe Rakesh, if you want to say a couple of words on the cash on hand question and how funders are helping their grantees think strategically. Great. Great question. Uh, thank you, Sylvia, for the reminder. And a great question. I, you know, um, we think a, a, a key part of organizational health is exactly the amount of months of cash on hand. Um, I, I think funders need to take a whole of organization approach when they want to support effective work. It's not, you know, we, our work, while we agree on a shared set of goals, is largely unrestricted funding towards those shared goals. And the key part of that is having enough liquidity, enough having, you know, enough cash on hand. And so that's very much a perspective that is needed now, but is needed at all times, as Olivia said at the beginning. And a key part of what CoImpact does and a lot of other funders do that we've also learned from is to make organizational strengthening a core part of our program support, right? So not to treat our partners as, as kind of subcontractors who will just, you know, deliver on the project that we care about, but rather to think of the whole organization, what strengths and what does it need to be capable? What does it need to be able to weather crises? What kind of uh, space and buffer do they need in order to be able to deal with unexpected events such as the one we're dealing with. And we make that a core part of our focus. We put resources towards that. And we think that's essential because in the end, it is strong organizations that can do effective work and make that work last over a long time. So we need to not only focus on the project outcomes, we also need to focus on how can our support make the organizations we support stronger. Great. Thank you, Rakesh. Um, if I look um, at what we have here, I think we, there's one more question and then um, I know time is getting on. So then I think we were going to wrap up. I think Olivia, you had a question asked directly to you on the, on the chat function or on the Q&A. Uh, yes, and there's one more also on the Q&A, which came in around April 30th deadline, which we can, we can also answer. So, um, so the, the, the question that I was asked was, how to think long term and enable our grantees to do so when the house is on fire. Um, what's what's the approach to doing that? And I think it's actually very related to um, what Rakesh was just talking about, uh, because um, certainly, and I, I, I think um, many of us relate to this, that this crisis is enormous. And at the same time, we know that there are so many Joes that actually feel like it's operating as though one's house is on fire when it is also about figuring out funding and figuring out continually sort of the ongoing funding and what does that mean for one's own organization. So I think even when there isn't a crisis, it's really hard to plan for the long term because of that. And so figuring out how as funders we can provide that flexibility and also provide um, a long enough Time zone to be a time horizon to be able to have that strategic coherence that's required in order to plan for the longer term. It's all the more true now. So I think it's always true, but it's all the more true now in a crisis, which is figuring out how can we provide longer term, more flexible funding that allows for these organizations and leaders to have the space. And it probably isn't happening this week or next week, but it really is as we continue through this crisis to be starting to really plan and say, what does this mean? How does it shift what we need to be doing? And to have the space to be able to do that when not necessarily worrying about how do you ensure that your people are paid and that you know, where is that next, um, that next funding coming from? So I think um, that, that it certainly that's one key, key way to do that. Thanks, Should we answer then, quickly the April 30th? Yeah, round three, more. I think that's Rakesh, <laughs> on the April 30th deadline and the uh, for round three. Sure. So Catalina asked that question. So our deadline used to be March 31st, uh, and then a few weeks before that March 31st, we extended it by one month to April 30th. So 
Uh, April 30th remains a deadline and that is the extended deadline. Uh, we've got feedback from many people that they really appreciate that one month's extension. We probably will not extend it any further because you know um, these organizations also have important work to do and plans and you know it's about getting the balance right between giving people time but not delaying things so much that the work gets kind of backed up. I, I see there's a question from Caroline uh, Fiends as well around uh, that I'll, I'll start off answering others may have more is how do you identify groups and I think I think that is an important question. You want, how do you support groups that are doing effective work? Our own experience is that the people, for example, on the issue of domestic violence, uh, the people who are working on domestic violence and have been working on it for a long time, who have the experience, who have the relationships, who've done the vetting, they are the ones to go to during the times of crisis. So for all of these issues, that's, you know, it's, it's to work with existing groups, existing infrastructure who already have the relationships on the ground and are, that are trusted. Certainly in the case of health workers, we find that through our partner Last Mile Health, who is part of a larger coalition of community health impact providers, they are the best place to support. And right now they are working together. They are able to absorb additional funds and put them to good use quickly and judiciously. Um, so that would be, I think, our core answer. Work with people who already have been, who have a track record and have the relationships of working on this. Great. Thank you, Rakesh. And I think now that we're, we're coming to really the, the end of time, so, um, you know, if additional questions already come up, then, you know, please do, do reach out to us. I think one of the things that Rakesh was just speaking to is about obviously Last Mile Health and the strengthening work that they're doing in Liberia, but also in, in Malaria as well. And we also touched on Project ECHO, who are in India and 38 other countries around the world, in, including the US and, and, and many others. And, and actually, we're very happy to share here that at, um, at CoImpact, we've actually set up a specific systems response facility, particularly for our program partners who are working on health systems. Um, for example, in the case of Project ECHO, they've been asked by the government of India and ministries and the CDC to really step up the type of work that they, do it, they are doing and pivot a lot of it. Well, pivot's probably the wrong word, but to, to in, engage very much around COVID-19 response in terms of how they are actually training frontline workers on things like how to operate a ventilator. And so from our side, what we are, we are doing is actually trying to facilitate more donations to that work um, in addition to the, the donations and, and the grants that we're already funding. And so we're actually able to um, accept um, donations of over 50,000 um, US dollars to all of these, uh, to these initiatives. And for all those donations, we will actually be covering all the administrative costs ourselves. Um, and so CoImpact really is trying to, when we spoke about supporting um, our partners in their fundraising, trying to really act as that matching um, type of platform, particularly for these partners, because of their work or strengthening systems are really needing to ramp up very quickly and right now. And, and if you'd like more details on any of that, um, you can see um, Stephanie's contact details are on the, um, on the screen and would be very happy to share more details on that. Um, on the other side, from my side, this has been a really um, wonderful discussion. It's great to see everybody that's um, logged on. It was really good to see all the discussions going on in the chat. What we will do after this webinar is share the slides, share the recording, share the output of the chat so you can actually see all of those, those links. And we also welcome you to, um, to share this with um, colleagues and other, other funders who you know who are probably grappling with the same questions. Um, we'll be very delighted for you to, to do that. Um, and otherwise, please do stay in touch. You see our Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, our uh, website there. Um, and, you know, it only leaves me to say thank you so much for your interest and your engagement. Um, really hope you all stay healthy and uh, I wish you all a really good rest of your day um, and look forward to speaking hopefully in person soon. Bye bye. Thanks all. Bye. 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 Bye.